Yeah, hello and a very warm welcome at the Kino of the DFF, Deutsches Film Institute and Film Museum. My name is Andreas Beilhertz. I'm today here instead of Laura Teixeira because she's in Brazil right now. She returns next week and then, um, as usually, we'll present the lecture next week again. Um, yeah, I'm glad um, we have uh, another um, great guest tonight and we have um, also um, upcoming events that I want to point out uh, shortly and next week it's um, platform it's a very long film therefore we start already on 6 um, 15 um, on, on the film will start at 7 uh, 15 p.m. so um, please note it's earlier than in announced in the maybe early flyers and then we have Shia Jean Ke, the director himself be here present at February um, 16th in the evening with a master class and a film he chose uh, to present here uh, The Boys of Feng Kui by um, Jia Jian so it's um, the sa ticket sales for this evening will start um, next Tuesday and yeah, it will be great to have him personally here um, just shortly before he presents a new film at the Berlinale. Um, yeah, I want to thank our cooperation partners, uh, the Institute of Theater, um, Film and Media at Goethe Universität, the Forschungsverbund Normative Orders at Goethe Universität, the Graduatenkolleg Konfiguration des Films, Hessische Film and Medien Akademie, and the Confucius Institute in Frankfurt, and of course also in a Synologie. Uh, of the Goethe Universität Institute, and yeah, I'm glad um, that um, our guest Chris Berry um, will now be introduced by um, Carsten Storm, the Vertretungsprofessor of Synology in Goethe Universität. Um, yeah, very well, welcome to Carsten Storm. Hello, good evening. Also, a warm welcome from me. And first of all, I also like to welcome our distinguished guest who will present soon his lecture. Um, I'm going to shortly introduce uh, Chris Berry uh, from King's College in London to you. Um, so I will talk a little bit about his uh, background and uh, his positions and the, the way he made in his life somehow. I, he, I, I get a notice to keep it short. Uh, I will try. Um, so uh, Chris started his education at Leeds University and you will see now his career leads him around the world uh, somehow. Um, and after doing his BA in, in Leeds, he changed uh, to the US, uh, where he did his MA and his PhD at UCLA, uh, both in uh, theater arts uh, departments. Um, and um, he went on afterwards and directly kind of got also with his jobs uh, and his positions uh, into the film business. Um, he was the consultant of the China Foreign Languages Press and China Film Corporation in Beijing from 1985 and to 1987. And um, as he said to me, uh, he think he was quite lucky on, on doing this because this was also the time when the famous fifth generation of, of China took off and um, he was there at that moment and uh, I think it helped him a lot to, to make connections and to get into um, this special area of Chinese film. Um, so the uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this fifth generation thing um, the, the, the big names of Chinese cinema as they um, came, as they became uh, popular in the West are connected to this, like Zhang Yimou and Chiang Kai-ge, um, Tian Zhuang Zhuang and, and many more. So um, from that on he uh, had um, positions as lecturer in Australia, um, so further away somehow. Um, then he became an assist associate professor uh, in film studies at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, so back to the US again. Um, and um, <clears throat> then he went back to where he originates from, to London. Um, first he became professor of film and television studies at Goldsmiths uh, University of London. Um, and now, um, as uh, I have said before, he's at King's College London. Um, he has held uh, a long row of visiting scholarships and, and he is uh, senior research fellows at, at different uh, positions. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the more exact things. Um, instead, um, I would like to, to put your um, <coughs> 
we are conscious to uh, other things he, he does. Uh, so he is very active as an editor. Um, he edits two book series for the Hong Kong University Press, um, uh, Trans-Asian Screen Cultures and Queer Asia. He is also quite active as a curator and has curated several film sessions and also works as a juror in uh, different film festival juries. Um, <coughs> As for his uh, major interests, uh, it is on Chinese uh, and East Asian cinema, so greater China, I would call it in a certain sense, uh, but, but not only. Um, <clears throat> so that includes uh, films from the PRC, from Taiwan, from Hong Kong, uh, and from Tibet. Um, he also takes interest in, in screens and public space, uh, and also in, in gender, sexuality, and cinema. <laughs> Um, and um, also one thing that is connected to the field that I came to know uh, um, Chris Berry from, that is the field of Taiwan studies, an interest in documentary films, um, which is, I think, in Taiwan studies a more newer thing to, to develop. Um, as uh, for his publications, uh, I'm not going to read out too many of these. Uh, it's a long list of uh, articles and so. Um, there is one major book uh, that, that is called Post-Socialist Cinema in Post-Mao China, The Cultural Revolution After the Cultural Revolution. Um, and besides that, there is also a long and very interesting range of edited volumes. Um, and I think that is also uh, the point where I came to know Chris Berry's name first, um, with uh, two books uh, that are called Chinese Films in Focus, which at that time I would say were major connecting points for, for, stu for, for students um, and academics, at least in Europe, to get into contact with specific Chinese films. Um, since this is uh, uh, two volumes that uh, start to look on cinema and films from specific films. And they don't start from theory and then look how <laughs> films might match into that, but they start from one film, you get an interpretation, and then you get a connection to theory, um, which uh, is quite interesting. Um, there's one or two further things I would uh, like to mention here. Um, there is a four-volume major publication um, that is called Chinese Cinema, um, which um, I don't know if there's any original work. It, it's all reprinted, I think, um, but it collects um, a whole range of, uh, of Chinese film studies uh, and, and Hong Kong and, and um, Taiwan film studies from the um, late 1980s up to uh, 2011, I think, um, from all different uh, uh, other edited volumes uh, from, from journals and so, and here you get it really selected together in, in one volume, um, and it makes available um, valuable studies um, in this area. And uh, the other thing I would like to mention is the, uh, that uh, Chris Berry is co-editing with uh, other people, um, the Routledge Handbook of East Asian Popular Culture, which also is a very valuable source um, on, in this matter. So that is a kind of, yeah, I get the sign of stop it now, please. Um, <laughs> and I would follow this, um, so I, give the micro over uh, to our lecturer, uh, Professor Chris Berry, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Carsten. Um, it's always embarrassing to hear people introduce you, so that's why I'm going like, stop, stop. Um, and thank you very much for coming along tonight. It's very nice to see so many people here. Um, First of all, uh, I also apologize. Bei mir geht Deutsch nicht so gut, so I have to speak English, and I hope you will put up with that. Um, I'm going to try and do three things uh, tonight in this lecture. First, I'm going to place 24 City, the film that we're about to see, in the larger context of Jia Zhang Ke's career. <clears throat> Second, I'm going to make an argument that this film uh, is about the importance of ordinary people and their memories. And as such, it's a kind of supplement, at least, a supplement 
to official history. And some people might argue that it's also a challenge to official history. Um, and third, I want to go a bit further. Um, I think the, the, uh, the, the second part is fairly straightforward, but I would like to go a bit further. And I'd like to also argue that Jia's film challenge us, challenges us to rethink history as a form of, of discourse. It does this not only because it includes memories, but also because it's highly heterogeneous and not unified. From a conventional modern perspective, this would mean that it's not really history, and history as a discourse. But in the talk, I'm going to turn to uh, the earliest Chinese historian, uh, Sir Ma Qian, and his work, The Records of the Grand Historian, uh, written approximately 100 years BCE, to argue that we should consider 24 City as a challenge to modern history writing. So first of all, uh, a little bit about locating the film. Um, I think the looking at Jia's uh, work so far, and of course it's an ongoing career, uh, but looking at his work so far, um, and especially at his feature films, I think 24 City emerges as a kind of pivotal work um, in the center of this career so far. From the mid-90s through to the mid-2000s, he made a series of dramatic features, and then he had a kind of pause um, before he went on back to those dramatic features again after 2013. And during that pause, he made three feature-length documentaries. And in the middle of those three feature-length documentaries, he made 24 City, which is a hybrid work, um, mixing together documentary and scripted material. Um, most of the film, as you will see, is, consists of nine interviews. And of these interviews, four of them are scripted and performed. I think you will recognize immediately one or two of the uh, stars who are performing the uh, scripted interviews. Uh, but in fact, there are four. And for Chinese audiences, those stars would all be immediately recognizable. Um, and now, just to give you a little bit of background on the historical context and so on. Um, as I mentioned, the film is, is structured around these interviews. And these interviews are with uh, workers at a former um, uh, state-owned factory, 420, which is in Chengdu, um, in the southwest of China. And they remember their experiences at the factory, either as workers or as the children of workers, and they remember their parents' experiences. Um, as the second interviewee, uh, the former deputy head of the Communist Party Committee, Guan Feng Jiu, explains, the plant, uh, the factory, was originally established in Shenyang, in the northeast of China, as Factory 111. And what it did there in the northeast of China in the 1950s was repair MiG fighter planes. Um, and of course, these were the planes that were involved in the Korean War. And in his interview, Guan explains that after the Korean War had made everyone in China aware of the potential vulnerability of northeastern China to attack, there was a decision to move the plant and 60% of its personnel, its staff, all the way down to southwest China, where it became uh, Factory 420, uh, sorry, 240. Um, this relocation marks it as part of the Cold War policy to move strategic industry away from China's, China's frontiers. And this became known as the so-called Third Front policy, which Guan mentions explicitly in the interview. When the film uh, was being made, uh, the Cheng Fa Corporation had already taken over the factory. Uh, they had sold the land uh, and they were moving its operations out into the suburbs. The factory itself was about to be demolished to make way for a luxury apartment and office complex called 24 City. So this is the background to the film, which I think you need to know before you see it, uh, and uh, you will realize very quickly 
It's about um, the great human uh, projects, the great, great effort and sacrifice that humans made in the huge uh, projects of the Mao era. So the second part, I'd like to talk about um, this idea of um, history as memory, and this is a memory project that intervenes in or contributes to our understanding of what history is. Um, so first of all, let's uh, just note um, that the Chinese title of the film includes a word that's missing from the English title, this word ji. So the, the, uh, the English title, 24 City, the Chinese title is 24 City Ji. And this Ji by itself can mean notes. So a fuller translation perhaps could be notes on 24 City. But this Ji is also the first part of the composite word Ji, which means memory. And therefore, various scholars, including Corey Schultz, have pointed out that the full translation of the title perhaps would be better as 24 City Memories. Now, I think that um, memory is invoked in various ways in nearly all of Jia Zhangke's films. They nearly all look back into the past, the time of his own memory, um, and the memory of his generation. And that's true for both dramatic features and documentaries, and the short films as well. But among all these feature-length films, 24 City is the only one that foregrounds memory in its very title. And, you know, as Tony Raines points out in his essay on the film, most of the running time is given over to the interviews. And all these interviews are, in, in a sense, oral history accounts of the memories of the various people's experiences in the factory. Now, I don't want to go into detail about those memories before you see the film. That would be inappropriate. But I will uh, draw your attention to a few features of these memories as we witness them. Uh, one running theme concerns how values have changed. Things are not the way they used to be. Another theme is the idea of self-sacrifice, what people gave up in this period. And as you will see, in some cases, it's fairly dramatic. The interviews with the younger people that come a little bit later in the film uh, are a bit more optimistic because they are doing well and they have uh, future hopes or hopes for the future, I should say. But even here, the emphasis in, the, uh, in, the, in, in their discussions is on their realization of the price that their parents' generation paid as they remember various visiting their parents in the factory, things like that, um, and what happened when the factory was sold under marketization and so on. Um, whether they are about changing values, self-sacrifice, whether they are rec recollected by the person who experienced that self-sacrifice, or whether they are performed by an actor, these scripted interviews, all these memories are very moving, they're very emotional. And the emphasis, in other words, is not so much on trying to record and verify facts, but much more on trying to capture these emotions associated with these experiences. Now, Jia himself <clears throat> has been clear in various interviews uh, about his uh, reasons for uh, collecting uh, these memories. Um, and I'm going to show you now a few quotations uh, from what he says. Um, it's quite striking. Um, he speaks of and uh, my sense that memories of China's mid-20th century are disappearing. I must use documentary uh, to tell my stories and prevent not only the disappearance of memories, but also the dis disappearance of the architecture, the buildings, the disappearance of the whole generation of people after 1949. Um, in another conversation, he, in, he indicates that he sees this work as adding something missing when he notes, when we look back at the important historical moments in China this century, we can only find state-recorded images. We have none 
from the point of view of regular citizens. So this is what he's trying to do. Um, in, in these remarks and in the film itself, the implications of collecting these interviews from the point of view of regular citizens are not further explored. But in some other interviews, uh, mostly made around the time of the release of the film, uh, when the Chinese political environment was quite a lot more relaxed than it is today, Jia suggests the possibility of a more critical dimension to his work. For example, he notes that it would be impossible for the government to record the experiences I am recording, just because a lot of the memories I am committing to film are actually the unhappy reactions of a lot of common people about recent government policies. And I think an official film team cannot make films criticising official policies. He goes on in the same interview saying, we are encouraged to sacrifice ourselves as people are forced to under fascism, but the price is high. What the West is not seeing is the stories behind these mobilisations and the sometimes tragic consequences for the individual under totalitarianism. This was an interview from 2009, so uh, 10, 11 years ago. Um, I don't imagine he would uh, say that now. Although Jia listens to and honours the experiences of older generations, it is also clear, I think from these comments, but also from what we see in the film, that this is not a film of nostalgia for the, for the era of the planned economy. You know, even though he values very strongly, let's get in touch with those memories, let's feel the emotions associated with them. This is not about a desire to go back, and that's for sure. Uh, the recording of memories and their dissemination uh, via the public medium of film also has some consequences for our understanding of the relationship between memory and history. Memory is conventionally contrasted to history, where history is understood to be a public discourse about objective, documented, demonstrated facts concerning the past. Memory is understood to be individual, subjective, ephemeral, and also contemporary. However, memory studies as a field uh, of studies, of research, has always been interested in the times, places, and practices where these neat borders between history and memory fray. Um, many people consider Pierre Nora and Maurice Haubach uh, as the founding figures in the field. Um, and Nora's idea of sites of memory and Halbach's idea of collective memory are primary examples of this focus on a blurring between history and memory. A site of memory, a, you know, a, a monument, is public. Collective memory <laughs> is no longer individual, it's something shared, it's not purely subjective anymore. And Jar himself has claimed uh, that his scripted interviews are a form of collective memory based on many individuals, sorry, many f interviews with individuals. So he rejects the idea that these uh, scripted interviews should be seen as somehow fake or fictional. He sees them as composites um, rather of than uh, something made up. And furthermore, <clears throat> the English language title of his book in which the interviews appear is called A Collective Memory of the Chinese Working Class, um, which is not in the Chinese title. Um, Halbwax, who is uh, heavily associated with collective memory as a concept, distinguishes his work, research from other approaches to memory in various ways. I mean, he's working early in the 20th century. First, uh, its object uh, is contemporary memory, as opposed to the discipline of history's efforts to retrieve facts about um, times beyond actual memory. And also in his emphasis on the informal, unofficial and ephemeral, Halbwach's work stands in contrast to Nora's sites of memory, which are more often going to be officially endorsed in some way. Uh, material entities, such as museums and monuments. I think 24 City stands somewhere between these kinds of concepts. 
On the one hand, it does share and circulate individual memories, making them more collective, uh, as Halbach's idea of collective memory uh, is focused on. But unlike the kinds of social ephemeral practices Halbach's has in mind uh, with collective memory, once you record memories on film, uh, they're no longer malleable and ephemeral. And in this sense, uh, the f a film is more public, more permanent, and in those ways has some resemblance to Nora's site, uh, sites of memory. And so I would call this kind of memory uh, associated with film perhaps public memory to highlight its participation in the uh, production of uh, dynamic social discourse, uh, discussion and debate. Um, okay, so that's the second part of the talk. And now in the third part of the talk, I'd like to suggest and try to expand on my argument and, so, and argue that uh, Jia in this film is also asking us to think about the discourse of history, telling history, and different ways of doing that and challenging conventional modern ways of doing it. Um, so the discussion uh, of memory in history opens up questions about what we mean uh, by, by history. And I want to argue, um, as I said, that this challenges us to rethink historiography. And the first thing that we need to notice is that although it's composed of interviews, 24 City is not a simple oral history. It's not one of those films where you have a voiceover rendering an explanation with chunks of uh, you know, oral history to illustrate it. The most attention-grabbing deviation from simple oral history is indeed uh, the, the scripted interviews, the four scripted interviews. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, performed by stars, all of them readily recognisable to Chinese audiences, and some, uh, for example, Joan Chen, I think will be readily recognisable to you. The four figures you see on this uh, poster, these are the four stars, okay? So some of them you'll know, some of them you won't, but now you'll know which are the scripted interviews uh, from that, that, that image. Um, so the deployment of scripted interviews performed by stars takes 24 City beyond the conventions even of docudrama. It also generated a lot of controversy at the time the film was released in China, which I don't really want to discuss now, except to say that, as I mentioned before, Jia defended the use uh, of these interviews by saying they were composites drawn from real interviews and were not fictional. Although these oral history uh, interviews and the performed interviews may be what grabbed the most attention, there are a number of other elements that also disturb documentary realist conventions and make the film even more heterogeneous. First, there are various poems that appear during the film as text on screen, starting with one that is identified as a Tang Dynasty poem on the black screen that appears just after the title of the film. As well as classical Chinese poems, there are quotes from W.B. Yeats and other internationally known poets. In addition to the poems, there are also non-diegetic songs. Some of these take us back to the period uh, discussed in the interview, creating affective associations for the audience, emotional associations. I won't mention examples now, but you'll notice these when you're watching the film, I'm sure. Um, another noticeable component of 24 City is a series of at least 17 tableau shots. Some of the interviews and some of people who we assume must be other uh, workers in the factory. These are interspersed throughout the film, mostly as part of the transitional sequences between interviews. Corey Schultz argues that the result of filming people who are asked to hold a pose um, is not the same as photography itself. Um, he calls these tableau shots moving portraits because even though people are asked to hold still, of course they do move subtly. 
And furthermore, he argues this uh, unrelenting focus for perhaps 20, 30 seconds uh, or even longer on an individual uh, standing still pushes us into a very emotional, moving relationship with them. So emotion is something that gets emphasized there again. And finally, there's also a lot of documentary footage of people at work in the factory or what's left of the factory, as though Jia wanted to capture this before it disappeared forever. There are shots of old heavy equipment being used repetitively to stamp out bolts made of heavy of molten iron. The work seemed arduous and safety equipment seemed minimal. Again, it's difficult to see this as nostalgic, even though it may be uh, very moving. Perhaps um, as some, another scholar, Xiaodrang Deppman, who I think has either already spoken here or will be speaking here later, these fun perhaps she, she points out these shots function as kind of pauses, a bit like Ozu's famous pillow shots. Certainly their ambiguity opens up all kinds of possibilities for interpretation rather than pointing in a particular direction. Now, if we consider 24 City to be a kind of history, then its status as being combined of all these heterogeneous elements requires a bit more analysis. Um, Cicero proclaimed Herodotus as the father of history, and his reputation, Herodotus' reputation as the father of history, uh, rests on the argument that his writing distinguishes legend from fact, that it's based on research in the forms of travels and investigations to verify the facts, and that it also presents one person's coherent argument about those facts. In other words, Herodotus is seen as containing the seeds of what we see as modern history today. Contemporary his scholars of historiography often include uh, another author as an alternative uh, originator of historiography, the Chinese historian Sima Qian. Slepsturman refers to Herodotus and Sima Qian as the two fathers of history, and Thomas R. Martin has written a comprehensive comparative book about the first great historians from Greece and China. Um, Herodotus' work was written between 450 and 425 BCE, and it's an account of the origins and events of recently ended wars between the Greek states and Persia. <coughs> Sir Marchien's work was written between 100 and 190, uh, sorry, 190 BCE, and it's a comprehensive, sinocentric history of the world. Like Herodotus, Sir Machen's reputation rests in part on the fact that his writing about the past is distinguished from legend. So it's, in each case, they're the first people who try to distinguish history from legend. The text makes it also makes it clear that he traveled far and wide on fact-finding trips, a bit like Herodotus. But, Sir Marchien's records of the great historian is strikingly different from both Herodotus' history and modern history. Given that Sir Marchien makes it clear that his text is a filial mission to complete his father's work, uh, it's also likely that he was not the sole author, which compromises the idea of a single historian's account, an attempt to persuade. Furthermore, as Grant Hardy has pointed out, the Shiji offers a multiplicity of voices and perspectives, and to read the text is to enter a confusing world of narratives and counter-narratives, differing explanations and corrections, and a variety of literary styles and historiographical approaches. It presents neither a unified view of the past, nor a consistent interpretation of what history means. Now, um, just as Jajang Kerr's film includes a number of distinct and uh, incommensurable elements, so does Sir Marchen's book consist of heterogeneous components too. Stephen Durant, who's one of the major scholars on Sir Marchen, identifies five different types of component, and I'm not going to explain what they are because it's not the main focus of this talk, but they are basic annals, chronological charts, treatises, her accounts of hereditary households, and what 
Durant calls arrayed traditions, but most others translate as biographies. So it's a kind of compilation, if you will. And in the face of this sort of heterogeneous and puzzling collection of materials, uh, you know, I find myself wondering um, if Borges, uh, in his uh, famous heavenly emporium of benevolent knowledge, might have been inspired by looking at Sir Martin's text. And this is, um, you know, the uh, famous quote from Borges. Uh, in its distant pages, it's written that animals are divided into A, those that belong to the emperor, B, embalmed ones, C, those that are trained, D, suckling pigs, E, mermaids, F, fabulous ones, and so on. Okay. Um, Foucault proclaimed that this, uh, in his uh, introduction to the order of things, uh, claimed that this passage from Borges was the inspiration for his book, The Order of Things. Because, he states, in the wonderment of this taxonomy, the thing we apprehend in one great leap, the thing that by means of the fable is demonstrated as the exotic charm of another system of thought, is also the limitation of our own. In other words, in the face of a text, like Sir Machen's records of his grand historian, or Jadon Kerr's 24 City, it's important to resist seeing it as some sort of failure, you know, a, a, a failed modern history, or a fake documentary, as some people uh, dubbed 24 City. Instead, I think the challenge is to comprehend its difference in its own terms. In other words, what does it mean for Sir Martien to claim his history as a G or record? And what does it mean for Jia Zhang Ke to use this term G or record in the title of his film? I don't have the time to discuss all the arguments around Sir Martien's text, and I won't go there tonight. But what about 24 City? One way of understanding the heterogeneity of 24 City is through the lens of Jia's insistence on memory as part of history. Even if it's recorded and therefore no longer ephemeral, and even if the triangulation of multiple memories constitutes some sort of verification process, individual memories exceed the established conventions of modern historiography precisely because they remain subjective, they remain highly affective, um, and they are therefore singular. These characteristics are ones that conventional modern history has attempted to avoid. If memory and experience are to become part of history, then histori historiography itself must change to accommodate this singularity of every memory. Comparing the composition of Sir Martien's Records of the Grand Historian and 24 City reveals a similar combination of heterogeneous elements brought together, but laid out for the reader or the audience in a manner that has a certain logic and an order. In 24 City, that order is not religious, as some have argued is the case for Sir Martien's work, but rather the order is the revelation of the heavy price individuals paid for their role in the execution of the Third Front policy and the deep emotional impact it had on them and their descendants. The components that Jar has chosen to compose 24 City, while heterogeneous, all work to enhance not just our awareness uh, of the singularity of memories, but also their ability to summon up affect, and they work to summon up affect in us as well. Poems, songs from the era being remembered, ellipses, the tableaus that Schultz calls moving pictures, all these things not only make space for our own memories, but also amplify the affective, emotional quality of the various memories we hear and underline the, uh, the focus on the singularity of individual experience. In light of this logic, the inclusion of scripted documentaries performed by stars is perhaps at first sight the most puzzling component of the film. These scripts 
uh, stand in contrast to the interviews with individuals who recount their own unique memories. In a sense, it's understandable that some audience members found it difficult to accept them because they seem to undermine the authenticity of the film. But what is also striking is that others were as moved by these scripted interviews as they were by the real ones. Uh, Corey Schultz notes accounts of audiences crying when Zhao Tao, playing the personal shopper, uh, Suna, ends her interview, her scripted interview, with a statement of her faith that she can earn enough to buy her parents, her working class parents, an apartment in 24 City, because I am the daughter of workers. Um, apparently this reduced uh, audiences to tears. Uh, he goes on to argue that fiction produces real emotion and that these film memories, real and fictional, offer the viewer what Landsberg describes as pr prosthetic memory. Now Schultz sees the film as about memory rather than history and he takes these characteristics to indicate that the film is about emotion rather than a history However, it can also be argued, and I think that's what I want to argue, that like the other fictional and fantastic elements of Jia's films, the scripted interviews blur the line between the historical uh, or documentary and the fictional, underlining the composed quality of all history writing at the same time as they, un as they fold memories of multiple and singular subjective experiences into revised understanding of what history as a discourse is. Commentators have pointed out that Sir Martien produced his text as a private family project and not as part of his or his father's official job at court. Jia worked initially as an independent filmmaker who did not submit his films for censorship as long as he, for as long as he could. And it could be argued that he has tried to maintain some sort of distance from both the state and the commercial film systems to this day. Furthermore, Sima Chen's text was produced in an intensely authoritarian era when he himself was uh, given a death sentence that was commuted to castration uh, as a result of criticism. Today's one-party Chinese state is also an authoritarian state, and one that is tolerating less and less dissent, as many of you know. For Sir Martin, making most of his text a compilation of other materials was relatively safe. And perhaps the same is true for Jia. But Sir Ma also implied judgments by omitting certain individuals and documents. Perhaps Jia's focus on the experience of ordinary people rather than party and state leaders. There's just, you'll see in the film, there's just one interview with a, a party official and it's relatively short. Um, perhaps his omission of those voices can be read in a similar way. But in addition to the specific circumstances of Jia's own time and place, perhaps we should also consider the broader implications of bringing memory into history as realized in 24 City. By emphasizing the singularity of memory, Jia produces a text that resists the idea of a single and absolute truth of history. At the same time, as his own individualist reading of the Maoist era is clear in the narratives he selects uh, and the structure that moves from the memories of the older generation to more optimistic perspectives of a younger generation, he does not attempt to invalidate the perspectives and memories of his, of his interviewees, even when you sometimes hear his voice questioning them. He still lets, what, you know, lets their position stand. So the film opens itself up to a variety of understandings. And in this way, rather than the conventional unified argument of historiography, the inclusion of memory in history, rather than the segregation of memory outside history, has the potential to force and pioneer a more democratic and plural type of historiography, and not only in China. 
So thank you very much. Um, I hope you enjoy the film. I believe a short break now, 10 minutes, and then we'll see the film and then Q&A afterwards. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank uh, Chris Berry for his enlightening lecture and drawing our attention to <laughs> drawing our attention to some issues, and I'm sure some of them will come up uh, in the discussion as well. So I understand that we have roughly one hour, more or less, um, so it's plenty of time. And so the floor is open for Q&A. Okay. Yeah. So we are awaiting your questions or remarks. Uh, yeah, th thank you very much again, Chris, for, for the introduction. Um, could you tell a little bit more about uh, the, the production let's say the production logic of the film. Um, the, uh, in the credits, for instance, um, one of the companies that's listed is Office Kitano. Uh, Takeshi Kitano was the producer of the world and basically helped uh, Jajanka to establish himself as a director on the international festival circuit also. But what, what is cur curious and interesting is that he has this position as someone who works outside the regular Chinese film industry, um, but still manages to make films in China, certainly at this point, that are quite challenging to you know, official party doctrine and the official history uh, of China, as you um, clearly demonstrated in, in your intro. Um, so I was wondering what the importance particularly of, of like the, the external, the Chinese, uh, the Japanese co-producers uh, are in this situation. Um, just to add a little note, there's this interesting logic by which sooner or later all Asian directors end up making a film in France with Catherine Deneuve uh, which John hasn't, no, yeah. <laughs> John hasn't done yet, and I hope he never will. But uh, Koreeda, for instance, has just done done, He's done a this. Pair, and, maybe yeah, instead, yeah. and and Chai Ming Young has done it, and uh, you know. Uh, so so John is clearly not part of the French um, uh, ecology, but he has important outside partners to make that kind of cinema possible. Right. Um, I mean, I don't know the. Uh, particular details of the history of the making of this film. Um, <clears throat> but you're quite right that for Jia Zhang Ke, um, links outside China have been very important right from the very beginning. So um, his first recognition came with the film Xia Shan Going Home, uh, winning an award in Hong Kong in the independent film festival in sorry independent film awards in hong kong i've forgotten which year, which year um and that's where he met yulik Wai, who he then started to work with as his cinematographer and uh the producer he worked with for many many years as well was somebody he met there so from the very beginning he started working in a, a trans-border mode let's put it that way um, initially, his films were not sent to the film bureau for censorship. So there's a whole question of how one defines independent in the Chinese context. But um, certainly in the early part of this century and in the 90s, people thought independent meant you didn't cooperate with the government, you didn't put your films through censorship. And so the first two or three films, feature films, were not sent to the Bureau. Um, then in, I think, 2003, um, you had this kind of interest. He, he tells the story of getting a kind of call to come into the Film Bureau. And then they sort of sat down with him and he realized they had finally sort of noticed that he was making these films and winning awards all over the place in film festivals and things. 
at which point it became clear they were not going to let him continue to do that. So then he had to find a way to work within the system. And I think your implication is that having those co-producers outside, having sources, <coughs> excuse me, of some funding from outside gives him some greater autonomy, possibly, which I'm sure is true. This film was made uh, over 10 years ago in a very different China from the situation now. Um, I don't think he would be able, I mean, in this case, you, you would have noticed that as well as uh, Kitano, he also worked with Shanghai Film Corporation, film, you know. So he's working with a mainstream company in China as well as uh, an international co-producer. Right now, um, I think that it's this interesting situation for him where he has a high profile inside China, but he's had lots of problems getting films through the censors, getting them released recently. And that makes it harder for him to raise money again, because if you can't release the film, you, you can't get money back at the box office. So exactly where he's going to go right now, I don't know, in terms of you know, production mode and whether he will be seeking more funding from outside, I don't know. It's unclear. Um, he's, you know, he ha as a figure in China, he also has a very um, interesting status where he's a sort of celebrity. So he's, he's, more people know who Jia Zhangke is than have seen Jia Zhangke films. Um, so he, you know, in, in perhaps like Godard, someone like that as well, who at a certain point, right, historically. So if you are in the film scene in China or in film festivals or whatever, you'll find things going on that at first seem a little odd, where you'll see, I don't know, a women's magazine has called a, you know, together a panel uh, at the Shanghai Film Festival on recent images of women in film. And they get various women film directors and maybe an actress and so on on the panel. And they hire in Jia Zhangke to chair the panel. And it's not because of his film, because he's a celeb. And because he lends a certain tone of seriousness, but at the same time, you know, fame. So this is, so there's this interesting mix of Yes, he's a serious artist, but on the other hand, yes, he's also got this other kind of pers persona in Chinese public eye. Yeah. So any further questions or immediate follow-ups to what Chris has said? Any thoughts about the film? I'm not sure how many of you had seen the film before or for how many of you this was the first time. I don't know. Yeah, concerning concerning the film, um, as you mentioned, um, it has to do with memory. And uh, when I I saw the film, it, you know, I just thought that it is the place the film is situated. The factory seems quite alien in Chengdu because these older people are still talking in a way in their Dongbei dialect yeah and so the question f is um whether beside this oh, who's first of all whose memory is this i mean is it connected to chengdu to the to the west uh, to the northwest or to the center of china or is this uh dongbei memory which is somehow put in a different place and yeah, the first that one. Yeah, I it think seems these quite are all alien. It, it seems quite alien. I mean, there's the guy who talks about it being an island, right? Yes. And it, you know, inside Chengdu, in a very different place. Yeah. Which is exactly what you're observing, and you're quite right. Um, to me, it's about generations. You know, it's about a memory of a certain generation, and of the places associated with them. Um, 
and the factory, this factory seems to speak to that idea of the passing of a generation and a, and a particular set of experiences. Of course, you can't help but reflect on, or you, you may reflect on the fact that Today in China, there's also huge population displacements and movements going on to do with work, but driven by the marketplace more than by the state in terms of strategic interests and so on. So inevitably, I think, you know, you, you contrast, the con and, and it's helped by the younger characters in the film, you contrast what's going on now with what went on then. Um, I think... One of the things I was trying to say in the lecture was that you, all these materials are, are put in front of you, but exactly what to make of them is very much left up to us. Because although we do, we register the presence of Jia Zhang Ke in the interviews, partly because the people are looking at him, and partly because every now and then you hear him say something, a little tiny bit. It's not as though he's directing your interpretation of all this material very strongly. So you can put it together as a kind of, you know, I think some people saw it as nostalgic initially. It was clear from his interviews, but th those are of course outside the film, that he didn't intend it to be that way. But perhaps that comes from the fact that for the people themselves, in the memories that we're, we're witnessing, um, there's clearly a lot of mixed feelings. Yeah. And so it's not a straightforward thing at all, I think. And maybe that's part of what he wants to, you know, that's part of what he's capturing is that sense of remembering their pride, feeling, you know, and also those moments of despair and so on and so on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, they were they were quite proud. And afterwards, well, they they lost this this social role they, right. they obtained. Although, uh, yeah, moving. yeah, yes, and also I think in the interviews, were they they have the high status, but it's also made very clear that there's a e great expectation of self sacrifice that goes with yes. it. And of course, the woman who leaves her son behind is the most extreme example of that but even th that first interview with the guy you know who um, makes the tools and keeps using it and so on and when when he, um, he's visited later on he talks about how you know he, even if he missed a day he would go back and work overnight to make up for it and so on so you get this kind of this double thing going on all the time yeah, yeah I thought a bit about this Shuoku, this speaking about bitterness, mm. which is a, which is a topos in in Chinese, it's, mm. it's quite different from but what this we've is not seen. This, yeah. it's exactly, yeah. but you remember the hardship you have gone through, uh, but you appreciate it because that's in this case. In this case, yes. yes. I mean, I think that idea of speaking bitterness that was mobilized as part of political campaigns, right? In the right, 50s. right. It's different, but still, so this is very different. Yeah, yeah. but still, you have this this. The I get the proud and and the mm, how to say that I get the proud for my my life mm -hmm. out of what I've done, mm -hmm. yeah? and I and and I do this through hardship, mm -hmm. and without, yeah, and and that's the value of my life. Yes. And of course, that's what's being questioned, right? Yes, exactly. In you know the sense that in the factory's death, if yes, you will, yeah, you know, so the, was this yeah, worth it? Yes, yeah. yeah. This makes it very poignant, yeah. Yeah. So, anyone else? Thank you. Yeah, uh, me again. Um, uh, I mean, this this ties in with uh, what you were just discussing. Um, I think. It, it's important to point out the sheer formal mastery in this film. Uh, 
I mean, the, the, the two female star performances obviously are incredibly virtuoso uh, displays of acting prowess, uh, great storytelling. And what's, what's amazing is how he manages, particularly in the John Chen segment, to, you know, have John Chen pl play someone who was mistaken for John Chen and the mise en abîme, yeah, yeah totally right. mise en abîme, and and it's it, 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 in a way it's you know it's overblown, but but it still works, and to keep that balance, and to have the series of of the three female portraits with the woman who loses the son, and then uh, the two star performances, and still not break the <laughs> unity of the film. The woman who loses the son is also a major star. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, but but one of the things that really got to me is is uh, the opening sequence, the musicality, the sheer musicality of that, the the rhythm, the sounds, the sound perspectives, the way the factory sounds move into the singing and then the sound perspective, and then in the end, the echo of that sound in the reminiscence of the, the female character who speaks about uh, the soundscape of the factory where her mother works. And that is exactly the sound that we heard in the beginning. So there's this, uh, this kind of loop. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so what's striking is, is the balance between artifice and, and the documentary aesthetic here. Uh, and you gestured towards the reception of the film. You briefly talked uh, about how people broke down in tears uh, uh, when it? they were watching the final scene. Could you tell us a little bit more about how yeah, the film was I mean, received in China? The film was controversial. Um, in Among critics and among sort of intellectual elites, if you will, um, among cinephiles, the kind of people who like Zhao Zhangke films. So <clears throat> normally... So when the film was first shown um, to film critics and the like in Beijing, uh, he was asked quite a lot of challenging questions. And of course, this is a time when, as I mentioned earlier, he's been pushed into having to make films in the industry in a more mainstream way. So a lot of people challenged him saying, well, you know, did you just do this to cast people like Joan Chen and, you know, Lu Li Ping and so on to try to, you know, make make a film that you could sell into the market? And so there was a sort of accusation of faking it, and which is sort of ridiculous because obviously it's faked, right? I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, obvi it's obviously somebody performing because these figures are so recognizable. Um, so that was a very uh, ungenerous interpretation, but nonetheless, there was a lot of that at first, at least from uh, from critics, who felt he'd yeah sold out is the best way to put it. Um, but apparently, uh, there were also people who then, you know, reported back from screenings that audiences were very moved by the film in many cases. I mean, you know, and. <coughs> What was interesting was that quite melodramatic final scene with Zhao Tao was the one where the, the emotions got released, especially for uh, audiences who had memories of those times themselves. So again, these are uh, you know are reports. They're not. I have no. I don't know of any audience research. So they're anecdotes, if you will. But I do think the point that's interesting about that is the, the, you know, the, the idea that these um, performed interviews are as moving as the, re, the, in inverted commas, real interviews, or at least they seem to have been for a lot of audiences. And I think if the film, you know, if the film is working for you when you're watching it, it is for you as well. Uh, maybe for some people it doesn't work. They just can't get past sort of knowing that it's Joan Chen or whatever. But um, it seems for, for a lot of audiences they could, and so that goes back to your, you know, your your point about the soundscape. I think as well, because in the same way that the interviews are a mix of these scripted interviews, 
and um, you know interviews with work, actual workers. The soundscape is a mix of real things you know recorded on the spot in the factory, but also music laid over the top, um, music that's composed for the film, but also old songs and things that are found and put in there. So that it's, again, this mix of elements, some of which are documentary and some of which are not. But as you say, and I think I agree with you, that it's, it's very, uh, it's crafted in a seamless way um, to create a kind of atmosphere, yeah, that, that, that works for us, I think, yeah. So any more questions? I think today, as a special gratitude of the house, the back rows are also entitled to post questions. <laughs> if you Anybody in it? Uh, then I might jump in okay. for, for a moment, if I if I may. Um, uh, a question that also relates to the aspect of uh, the mixture of documentary and, and fiction, and also to the aspect of memory. What I found. Um, very interesting is this juxtaposing of the the narratives and the songs or poems uh, in between and i kind i had the impression that this was an attempt to make sense of life through appropriating culture a very iconic texts and the question is what does what this does make to memory especially to the subjective a part of, of memory. Is it still a subjective thing um, or does it get into a very broad uh, topoi-like uh, element of, of broader culture by, by just, you know, putting it together with these lines of, of well-known songs and poets, uh, poetry? Well, I think some of the elements that, um, some of the songs, for example, are songs that are referred to in the interviews. But then there are other things, such as the W.B. Yeats poems, for example, that no, nobody talks about in the interviews. So there's diff sort of s somewhat different things going on, it seems to me, um, in the, but perhaps they end up going in, in the same direction. So now I'll try and explain what I mean by that. So with, um, for example, the... Japanese song you hear. Uh, we realize this is from the TV series that the guy's been talking about in the interview. But then the W.B. Yeats poem, which I think, as you suggest, is being used in the film to somehow, you know, this idea of this, the, the milk spreading out, you know, in an uncontrolled way. Um, but also the lyrics of the Japanese song somehow well, the, it, make sense in that way. Yeah. Yeah, so the lyric, so yes, so they both are all about conjuring up certain emotions that the film wants to associate presumably with our interpretation or encourage us to feel an, a, as part of our process of coming to grips with the material. So it's not just about an intellectual process, but also an emotional process that we, sh through the music, through the poetry, we should also have these feelings, hopefully. But um, <clears throat> what does this do to memory? I think it highlights, or in terms of how we should think about memory, I think it highlights the extent to which memory is always triggered by things. You know, it's not, uh, there's something that makes you remember something. And memory can be in this sense can also is not something that's purely it may be subjective but it's not purely internal it becomes shared it becomes talked about uh you know you remember something you talk about it, somebody else their memories are triggered etc cetera, etc cetera. so there is this sort of multiplicity of triggerings going on through the use of these various interviews songs etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, that creates various things that are shared, but shared in individual ways. So in this sense, memory is quite different from conventional history, which tries to aim for some sort of singular objective truth. 
And I think that's part of what the film challenges us to take on board, perhaps, and, and to understand. Yeah. Does that maybe make some sense? I don't know. So, anything came up? Uh, um, the climax for me in this composition of song and pictures was when they sang the international ah, yes. and then you had the breakdown of the factory which is because the, the international is always connected in official memory with um, uh, with mm, with a bright future yeah, and then you have the collapse of the factory and this is just going contradictory to the traditional memory That's yeah i mean again what how we make the meaning from these things is complicated i think because of course the other um the other way of under the other way of understanding this would be I, I mean a more optimistic way if you want to put it that like that would be to say well this is the price of progress you know and that is a very common kind of sentiment um, that, it, you, that is expressed, I think, in that Chinese context. Um, and it allows certain things that in other ways can be seen as more resistant or more uh, negative, you know, to pass through um, and to uh, get, uh, you know, I think also of the Tibetan filmmaker Pema Tsetin, and a lot of his films are also about how modernity is changing and you know changing is an optimistic way of putting it um having a, very, a huge impact on tibetan life one way of looking at this is as a, as a, as a critique another way of looking at it is the sort of well this is the price we have to pay for development and and different again different audiences take it in different ways i think Uh, uh, just just a, uh, a little detail about that particular shot of the factory being and collapsing. It, um, it it may sound trivial, but it ends with the with, with the dust actually covering the entire image. And I don't, I, you know, that's a choice. You could have stopped earlier or put the camera camera further away. You could have moved the the the, the machine that's standing there, but uh, the, the shot is only complete once you have a white uh, screen in the end. And uh, just that blank white screen, which is also dust, but which you also know, you know, the dust will go away too. And we d You don't know what will be there afterwards. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so that's, for me, that was one of the most poetic moments of the film, actually, you know, letting that shot end with the widescreen of dust. Any further questions? The widescreen of dust is a great moment to end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Shall we end then? So then we end done. Uh, thank you very much again, Chris Berry, for thank delivering you. the speech and answering our questions.